Short Lives of the Dominican Saints, Part 11 August 8th, Blessed Augustine of Lucera, Bishop and Confessor, 1262-1323 Blessed Augustine Gazathi, or Cassiota, was born in Trau in Dalmatia of noble parents about 1262. He entered the Dominican order at an early age and was sent to study at the University of Paris, where he made extraordinary progress both in learning and sanctity. On his return to his native land, he preached with much zeal and fruit of souls and rendered important services to the church. He founded several convents of his order, and was held in great veneration as a wise and holy superior. In order to draw down the grace of God upon his ministry, he often spent the whole night in prayer, and he was accustomed to quote the words of St. Augustine. He knows how to live well, who knows how to pray well and those of blessed Jordan of Saxony. As the body is supported by mingling food and drink, so our souls are supported by mingled, mingled prayer and study of Holy Scripture. If any of his subjects appeared negligent in the observances of religious life, he would stir them up to better things by those other words of St. Augustine. Since I began to serve God, as I have hardly ever seen better men than those who live a holy life in monasteries, so have I never seen worse than those who live not in them as they should. The servant of God was next summoned to Italy, where he exerted himself with wonderful success in reconciling the rival factions of the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. Thence he passed into Bosnia, where his apostolic labors for the defense of the faith and the extirpation of heresy were rewarded by an abundant harvest of souls. His next mission was to Hungary, then torn by internal dissensions, and here he was associated with the apostolic legate Cardinal Nicholas Boc Bocassino of our order, who was afterwards raised to the chair of St. Peter under the title of Benedict the Eleventh, and who had received the honors of beatification. On becoming Pope, this holy man summoned his former colleague to Rome in order to raise him to the episcopate. When the servant of God presented himself for his first audience, the holy pontiff was suffering from acute rheumatism, and it was with difficulty that he stretched out his hand to greet him. Scarcely had the lips of blessed Augustine touched the suffering hand when all pain disappeared, and the pope found himself completely cured. Blessed Benedict, with his own hands, consecrated his friend, Bishop, and appointed him to the see of Zagreb, now called Agram, in Slavonia. On arrival in his diocese, the holy bishop won the hearts of his people by his ardent charity, his familiar instructions, and his numerous miracles. His clergy stood in great need of reform. But blessed Augustine, by his tact and the influence of his personal sanctity, soon effected a salutary change amongst them. His revenues were spent in relieving the poor and in completing the cathedral, begun by one of his predecessors. But he would never allow his family arms to be placed on the building, or on any of the gifts which he presented to it. He founded a convent of his order in his episcopal city, and loved to retire into it from time to time in order to refresh his soul by prayer and contemplation. 
God had granted him to an extraordinary degree the power of healing the sick. His humility became alarmed, and, in order to avoid the praises of men, he planted a lime tree, and, after offering a devout prayer, bade the people henceforth to sink their cure from the leaves of that tree. It soon became evident that this prayer had been heard, and even the Turks, when they took possession of the country, respected the health-giving tree, which was properly called St. Augustine's Lime Tree. After ruling the See of Agram for fourteen years, he tr was translated to that of Lucera, also called Nocera, in the south of Italy, at the request of Robert, king of Naples and Sicily, who was anxious to provide for the formation of morals in that part of his dominions. Whereas the Saracens had until recently had a footing, as soon as blessed Augustine entered his new diocese, he placed it under the patronage of the blessed lady, and decreed that his cathedral city should resume its former name of Santa Maria della Vittoria. By his prayers, labors, and example, he succeeded in less than six years in completely banishing from his diocese the superstitions and evil practices introduced by the Saracens, and his half-barbarous flock became a truly Christian people. His holy and happy death took place on the 3rd of August, 1323, and he was buried in the church of St. Dominic, attached to the convent which he had built for his brethren at Norsera. Many miracles were worked at his tomb, and he has been held in the greatest veneration from the time of his death. He was beatified by Clement the Eleventh. August ninth, Blessed John of Salerno, Confessor, thirteenth century. Blessed John of Salerno was a native of southern Italy, and belonged to the illustrious family of Quarna, which was allied by blood to the Norman princes, who long ruled over the kingdoms of Naples and Sicily. Whilst pursuing his studies at Bologna, he became acquainted with our Holy Father, St. Dominic, who himself received him into the order. From that time Blessed John made marvelous progress both in learning and sanctity, and became one of the columns of the Rising Institute. The Holy Patriarch regarded him with singular affection, and often took him as the companion of his journeys, and made choice of him to establish the order in Florence. Twelve brethren were selected for this important foundation, and Blessed John, though probably the youngest of the party, was appointed their superior. They took up their abode at first in a small convent which had been built for them at Ripoli, a few miles outside Florence. But this inconvenient abode was soon exchanged, first for San Pancrazio, adjoining the ramparts, and finally the Santa Maria Novella within the city. The eloquence and sanctity of the young prior drew many illustrious recruits to the order, and did much to stem the progress of the Manichaean heresy of which Florence was at that time one of the chief strongholds. He was a perfect model of a religious superior, a most exact observer of the rule, gentle, kind, yet firm in enforcing its observance on others. He spent a great part of the night in prayer, often ravished in ecstasy. He celebrated Mass with angelic devotion, abundant tears, and minute care in the very least of the sacred ceremonies. He would often impress upon his subjects that, if a religious is bound to aim at perfection in all his actions, 
there was none which demands of him so much vigilance, piety, and purity as the reception of the Holy Eucharist. God made known to him the secrets of hearts. Hence, on communicating days, he would often warn seculars of hidden faults of which they had been guilty, and his own young religious of failings which had escaped their notice. One day, when a possessed woman was being exorcised, the devil exclaimed, I shall not go out of her, save at the command of him who, is, who in the midst of the flames was not burnt. He was adjured to explain what he meant. Then, with frightful yells and contortions, he named the prior of the Dominicans. Blessed John was sent for, and immediately freed the woman from her infernal tormentor. And this circumstance revealed a signal victory which he had gained when snares had been laid for his chastity, and which, in his humility, he had hitherto kept concealed. The friars at Florence had the happiness of receiving two visits from St. Dominic in the years 1219 and 1220. The following year, Blessed John was summoned to Bologna to assist at the deathbed of his beloved father. During the closing years of his life, God favored the holy prior with the gift of miracles, and he wrought many remarkable cures. He established a convent of religious women of the order at Ripoli, where the friars had first been stationed, and worked to his dying day for the good of the church, the extirpation of heresy, and the propagation of the order. At length, having for many years governed the convent at Santa Maria Novella, worn out by his labors and austerities, he happily departed to our Lord, exhorting his brethren with his dying breath to keep their vows faithfully, to love God with their whole heart, and to despise all perishable things. His tomb became a place of pilgrimage and was honored by many miracles. It was customary to keep a lamp burning in the chapel, where the holy relics reposed. One day the oil failed, and the sacristan, seeing a poor woman kneeling in prayer before the shrine, begged an alms of her to renew the supply. She assured him she had not a drop of oil, nor the means of procuring any. Go home, said the brother. I am quite sure that, through the merits of the servant of God, you will find some in your house. The poor woman went home and was surprised to find the little vessel which she had kept her supply of oil full to the brim. She immediately returned to the church and related the miracle in the presence of witnesses. Blessed John of Salerno was beatified by Pius the Sixth. August sixteenth, Saint Hyacinth, Confessor, eleven eighty five to twelve fifty seven. This great glory of the Dominican Order belonged to the noble Polish family of Odrowatz whence at a later date sprang the house of Kostka, which gave birth to St. Stanislaus, the novice saint of the Society of Geniuses. St. Hyacinth was born in the neighborhood of Breslau in Silesia in 1185. He was nearly related to Blessed Ceaseless, possibly his younger brother, and from infancy gave promise of unusual talent and virtue, and an extraordinary gift both of nature and grace, especially of a tender love and compassion for the poor. As a child he would gaze at the portraits of his forefathers which hung in the halls of his ancestral home, and ask to be told the story of their exploits. And when he grew older, he would often encourage himself to higher things by the remembrance of their example. The early education of the two holy brothers was superintended by their uncle, Ivo Odrowatz, 
afterwards the Bishop of Krakow, who was so struck by the precocious sanctity of Hyacinth as to predict that he would one day be raised to the altars of the church. Both embraced the ecclesiastical state and accompanied their uncle on a visit to Rome, where, as he had been already related in the life of blessed Ceaseless, they were present when St. Dominic raised the young Napoleon to life, and subsequently received the habit of the order from the hands of the Holy Patriarch in the chapter room of Santa Sabina. St. Hyacinth, during his short period of probation, learnt faithfully to copy the life of our Holy Father, especially his spirit of prayer and penance and his zeal for the salvation of souls. Their novitiate over, he and his companion set out for Poland, preaching and founding new convents as they went along. Their route lay through northern Italy, Styria, Austria, Moravia, and Silesia. On arriving at Krakow, they gathered around them a fervent band of novices and established a large convent. Faithful to the Dominican law of dispersion, St. Hyacinth soon dispatched Blessed Ceaseless and Henry of Moravia to plant the order in Bohemia, whilst he himself set out to evangelize Prussia, Denmark, Scandinavia, and Russia. He realized St. Dominic's desire of preaching to the Cumans, among whom he found his brethren already laboring, and then continued his apostolic journeys through Turkestan, Tartary, and Tibet, as far as the Great Wall of China. Modern missionaries have found traces of his labors in these countries. St. Hyacinth also preached along the shores of the Black Sea, and in the islands of the Grecian archipelago. He ever bore a tender devotion to the Holy Mother of God, and she, in turn, showered down countless favors upon him. She once appeared to him on the feast of her Assumption, and gave him this consoling promise, Hyacinth, my son, rejoice, for thy prayers are pleasing to my son, the Savior of the world. And whatsoever thou shalt ask of him in my name, thou shalt obtain through my confession, intercession. From that day the saint's confidence was so increased that he was not afraid to ask even for things which were, naturally speaking, impossible of accomplishment. And his life became a series of miracles, such as such as it has been granted to few saints to work since the days of the apostles. One day when the saint was beginning his mass in the convent at Kiev, the Tartar suddenly broke into the city, and he and his community were compelled to take to flight. Still clad in his sacred vestments, St. Hyacinth took the blessed sacrament from the tabernacle and prepared to depart. But when he got halfway down the church, he heard a voice proceeding from a huge alabaster statue of our Blessed Lady, saying, Hyacinth, my son, wilt thou leave me behind to be trampled underfoot by the Tartars? Take me with thee. How can I, holy virgin, replied the saint, thy image is too heavy. Take me nevertheless, answered our lady, my son will lighten the burden. Then the saint clasped the massive image in one arm, and, bearing the blessed sacrament in the other, went forth courageously and crossed the Dnieper dryshod. Whilst his brethren, who followed him, stretched their mantles on the water, and, embarking upon them, also traversed the river in safety. The miraculous image is still preserved at Lemberg. When the term of St. Hyacinth's earthly pilgrimage was drawing to a close, as he was one day saying Mass, he suddenly beheld a dazzling light descend from heaven, in the midst of which appeared a long procession of angels and virgins, 
forming an escort to their queen. The celestial company prostrated around the altar while the saint offered his holy sacrifice. At its conclusion he saw Our Lady, crowned by her divine Son, with a crown of flowers and of stars, which Mary then took from her head and showed it to him, saying, Behold, this crown is for thee. He was taken ill on the following feast of St. Dominic. On the eve of the Assumption he made a touching address to his brethren, which, after he rose to assist at the matins and mass of the festivals, then, kneeling on the altar steps, supported by his weeping children, he received the holy viaticum and extreme unction. They carried him back to his cell, where he calmly awaited his release. When the end was close at hand, he intoned the thirtieth psalm, In thee, O Lord, have I hoped, and breathed forth his holy soul to God at the verse, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. It was the 15th of August, 1257. After his death he appeared in glory to the Bishop of Krakow, in company of the martyr bishop, St. Stanislaus. He was also seen by a holy nun who lived near Krakow, being led by Our Lady into heaven amidst a glorious company of angels and of saints. Almost innumerable miracles were worked at his tomb, including the raising of as many as fifty persons from the dead. He was canonized in 1594 by Clement the Eighth, and Urban the Eighth extended the celebration of his festival to the Universal Church. August 17th Blessed Emily Bicieri, Virgin, 1238-1314 Emily Bicieri was born of pious and noble parents at Vercelli, in Italy, on the 3rd of May, 1238. She lost her mother at an early age. She cast herself at the feet of Our Lady's statue and besought the Holy Mother to take her under her special protection. At the age of sixteen she made known to her father her ardent desire of embracing the religious life in the Third Order of St. Dominic. He built and endowed for her a large monastery outside the city, dedicated to St. Margaret. Thither she retired in company with some other maidens of noble birth, and at the age of twenty became prioress of the new community, which she governed with great prudence and charity, using her most earnest endeavors to maintain regular observance, and to cause her subjects to advance in the path of perfection. The point on which she chiefly insisted was purity of intention. She was never weary of exhorting them to be assiduous in the contemplation of the divine mysteries, and she was accustomed to say that a nun who is not thoroughly exercised in this kind of prayer is like a stranger going to a city in order to make purchases, and not knowing with whom to deal with or what to buy. She taught them the lesson of humility by her example, even more than by her words, for, though she was foundress and prioress of the house, she always took her turn in discharging the lowliest offices. Blessed Emily was wont to train her children to practice little acts of mortification, and to place them in the hands of their guardian angel until they could stand in need of them to cancel their debt in purgatory. Thus she often refused a certain sister Cecilia leave to drink out of me meal time, bidding her to offer her privation to our Lord in union with the thirst he endured upon the cross. The sister died and appeared to her prioress at the end of three days, telling her that she would have 
had to stay a considerable time in purgatory, but that on the third day her guardian angel had come and quenched the flames with that water of which she had felt it so hard to deprive herself when on earth, and that she was now taking her flight to heaven. Another sister had fallen into a state of tepidity, an extreme disrelish for all her spiritual duties. Blessed Emily, perceiving her haste to get out of choir, and learning the cause from her own lips, commanded her, in virtue of obedience, henceforth to be the last to leave the choir. The sister obeyed, and from that day not only did all her disrelish for prayer vanish away, but she took pleasure in prolonging her devotions for a considerable time after her companions had retired. The holy prioress had the most ardent love for Jesus in the adorable sacrament. She was permitted to communicate thrice in the week and on all festivals, which in those days was unusually frequent communion. Her humility took alarm, and she resolved to abstain for a time from approaching the holy table. But our Lord would not keep his spouse to fall into this dangerous delusion. He appeared to her radiant with celestial glory, saying, Beloved spouse, why art thou afraid to approach my banquet? Have I not prepared it on purpose that I might feed thee with my flesh and blood? Come without fear, and look not so much at thine own vileness, but rather on the loving pity which has moved me to institute this sacrament for the happiness of my creatures. Learn that those who receive me out of love please me infinitely more than those who keep away from me out of fear. Reassured by this vision, the servant of God thenceforth hungered more and more after the bread of angels. One day she was detained at the bedside of a sick sister, and thus prevented from communicating with the rest. As soon as she was free, she went out to the choir and lovingly offered to our Lord the great privation which she had suffered. An angel immediately appeared and brought her holy communion in the sight of all her sisters. Blessed Emily was very devout to the passion of our Lord, and he promised her to grant an increase of three th of the three theological virtues to all who should recite three potters and aves daily at about three o'clock in the afternoon in honor of his crucifixion. Our Lady also instructed her to say three potters and aves for the dying, in gratitude for the agony and bloody sweat of her divine Son, telling her at the same time that this devotion was very pleasing to him. When the city of Vercelli was visited by violent and prolonged rain, the Blessed Virgin taught her some prayers of special efficacy against storms. The servant of God had very great faith in the power of the sign of the cross and of holy water, and was endowed with the gift of miracles. At length, at the age of seventy-six, she was seized with her last illness. Having received the holy sacraments with much devotion, embraced each of her sisters and spoke to them words of edification with the holy names of Jesus Mary Dominic on her lips. She departed to her spouse on the 3rd of May, which was her birthday, in 1314. She was beatified by Pope Clement the Fourteenth. August 23rd Blessed James of Mavania, Confessor, 1220-1301 Blessed James was born in Navania, now called Bivagna, 
a little town of, in Umbria, of the noble family of the Bianconi, in the year 1220. On the day of his birth there appeared in the sky above his native place three large and brilliant stars, each bearing on its disk the image of a friar preacher. On beholding this extraordinary phenomenon, which lasted all through the night and part of the following day, the children of Bavagna began to run through the streets, crying out, To the schools! To the schools! Behold the new masters from heaven ascending us! As blessed Ambrose of Siena was born that same year, and St. Thomas Aquinas some five years later, the prodigy has since been regarded as having had reference to these three great luminaries of the church and of the order. Little James was carefully brought up by his pious parents and gave early signs of his future holiness. He prayed much and fasted often, and a sudden and unlooked-for reconciliation between his family and that of the Alberti, with whom they had been at variance, was regarded as due to the prayers and merits of the saintly child. When he was sixteen, two Dominicans came to preach the Lent at Bedvagna. Blessed James attended their sermons, closely studied their manner of life, and began to feel himself drawn to the new order. After his communion on Monday, Thursday, as he was devoutly reciting that verse of the 118th Psalm, Set before me for a law the way of thy justifications, O Lord, and I will always seek after it. He received an inward assurance that his vocation was from heaven. He immediately went to one of the fathers and opened his heart to him on the subject. He was told to spend the night in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament, and to fast on the morrow on bread and water, in order to be more fully assured of the divine will in the matter. He obeyed, and St. Dominic then appeared to him and said, My son, put thy design into execution, for I have chosen thee by order of the Lord, and I will ever be with thee. After Easter, the holy youth returned with the fathers to their convent at Spoleto, and entered on his noviceship with great fervor. During the early years of his religious life, he made it his constant petition to God that he might have the grace to labor efficaciously at the work of his own sanctification, in order to be able later on to contribute to that of others. Blessed James went through his studies with distinction, and was afterwards employed in teaching and preaching with much fruit of souls. After a time he was sent to Bavagna, then torn by hostile factions. He succeeded in restoring peace and concord amongst his fellow citizens, and in purging the town of heresy, immorality, and superstition and obtain leave to establish a convent of the order in its midst, of which he became prior. His exact observance of the rule made him a living pattern to his subjects. He was specially severe with himself in the matter of poverty. One day his mother, seeing his tattered habit, gave him some money to provide himself with a new one. Now it happened that, at the time, he was much in want of a crucifix for his cell, and he accordingly spent his mother alms in buying one. When next she saw him, she reproached him for what he had done, bidding him notice the rags in which he was clothed. But he answered sweetly, Mother, I have not disobeyed your wishes. Does not St. Paul bid us put on the Lord Jesus? That is the garment which I have purchased. One day when he was praying, probably before this very crucifix, 
in an hour of great anguish of spirit and begging of God to give him some assurance of his eternal salvation, a stream of blood burst from the side of the sacred image and flowed over his face and clothes, and at the same time he heard a voice saying, Let this blood be to thee as a sign of thy salvation. For a long time he was unable to obliterate the traces of this miraculous favor, and the joy which it caused him so quickened the fervor of the divine love in his heart that he ceased not to sigh after the moment when he should be dissolved and be with Christ. On the Feast of the Assumption in 1301, our Lord appeared to him with the joyful tidings that in a week's time he would have taken him to himself, telling him that Our Lady should be present at his death, because he had spent on adorning her image some money which had been given him to buy clothes for himself. St. George should be there, because he had enlarged his church, and St. Dominic, because he had worn his habit. After receiving the last sacraments with much devotion, he called for a glass of water, which he blessed, and it was instantly changed into the most delicious wine, of which he drank himself, as did also all of the bystanders, and yet the contents of the glass were not diminished. This miraculous wine was preserved for more than two centuries, and was the means of working many miracles. At length the glass which contained it was contemptuously broken by a heretic, who had made his way into the sacristy where it was kept, and the precious contents were lost. When the brethren were reciting the prayers prescribed by the constitutions for the repose of the soul of blessed James, a heavenly voice stopped them with the words, Pray not for him, for him, but invoke him for yourselves. His body remained incorrupt, and a vast number of miracles were worked through his intercession. Pope Boniface the Ninth, in 1400, approved of the veneration which had always been paid to blessed James, and Clement the Tenth, in 1674, gave permission for the celebration of his festival. In fact, he is often spoken of as St. James of Mavania, two sovereign pontiffs having attributed to him that title and the process of his canonization having passed through all but the final stages. August 28th St. Augustine, Bishop, Confessor, and Doctor of the Church, 354 to 430. This great Doctor of the Church was born at Tagaste, in the north of Africa, in the year 354. His father, Patricius, was a pagan and only received baptism shortly before his death. His mother, Monica, was a saint. Seeing the extraordinary talents of his son, Patricius spared no expense to give him the best education in his power and, when he had attained the age of sixteen, sent him to complete his studies at Carthage. The young Augustine had already fallen into bad company and although he devoted himself with ardor to the acquisition of rhetoric and philosophy, his life was one of sinful indulgence. He embraced the errors of the Manichaean heretics, in which he continued for several years. After his father's death, when he was about twenty years of age, he returned to Tagaste and set up a school of grammar and rhetoric. Meanwhile, his holy mother ceased not to weep and pray for his conversion. One day she had had recourse to a bishop, begging him to use his influence to reclaim Augustine from his evil ways. 
but he only bade her continue her prayers, adding, Go your way, God bless you. And it cannot be that the child of such tears should perish. After a time, Augustine removed to Rome, and then obtained a post as master of rhetoric at Milan, whither his mother followed him. Here he became acquainted with the holy bishop, St. Ambrose, and frequently attended his sermons. God was meanwhile opening his eyes more and more to the emptiness of those earthly ambitions on which his heart had hitherto been set, and, after long and painful struggles with himself, he at length made up his mind to renounce sin and embrace the Catholic faith. He was baptized by St. Ambrose on Easter Eve, 387. Towards the close of the same year he resolved to return to Africa, and was on the point of embarking when the death of his mother, St. Monica, at the port of Ostia, caused him to delay his voyage till the following autumn. On arriving at Tagasti, he took up his abode in a country house, where, in the company of some pious friends, he devoted himself to the exercises of prayer, study, and penance. After his ordination to the priesthood, he moved to Hippo, where he founded another monastery, and later on a convent for nuns, of which his sister became the first abbess. Valerius, bishop of Hippo, employed him in the office of preaching, and made him his coadjutor in 395. And when that prelate died in the following year, the saint, sorely against his own will, became his successor in the episcopate. He induced all his clergy to renounce their property and live with him in community. He spent great part of the revenues of the church in relieving those in distress, and succeeded in establishing amongst his flock the charitable custom of clothing all the poor of each parish once a year. He would suffer no one to defame his neighbor's character, and, to show his disapproval of the vice of detraction, would withdraw from the company as soon as any injurious words were spoken in his presence. Besides the admirable book of his Confessions, St. Augustine has enriched the Church with a vast number of learned works, sermons, instructions, and letters. In spite of habitual weak health and frequent suffering, he was indefatigable in his labors for the exaltation of the Church and for the extirpation of heresy and schism, specially directing his efforts against the Manichees, Pelagians, and Donatists. He was the oracle of his day, and is generally regarded as the greatest of the Latin fathers. The closing years of this saint were saddened by the incursions of the Vandals into Africa, and his holy death took place in the year 430, whilst his episcopal city of Hippo was being besieged by these barbarians. Humility had ever been his characteristic virtue, according to his own beautiful maxim, attempt not to attain true wisdom by any other way than that which God has enjoined. This is, in the first, second, and third place, humility, and this I would answer as often as you ask me. Not that there are no other precepts, but unless humility go before, accompany, and follow after, all that we do will be snatched out of the hands of by pride. Our Lord Jesus Christ was made so low in order to teach us humility. 
This illustrious doctor of the church has a special claim on the love and veneration of the children of St. Dominic. As they serve God under the rule which bears his name, and which he wrote for the nuns of the convent which he had founded. When, in the year 1215, the Holy Father St. Dominic applied to Pope Innocent III for permission to found his order, the Council of Lateran had just decreed that no new orders were to be established in the Church, but that, if anyone desired to found a new religious house, he was to observe the rule of one of the approved orders. The sovereign pontiff, therefore, though convinced of the divine will as regards the institution of the order of preachers, was unwilling to act in direct contradiction to a principle so recently laid down. Hence he bade the holy founder return to France, and in concert with his companions, choose one of the ancient rules which should seem best fitted for their purpose. St. Dominic accordingly assembled his brethren at Pruil, and, after earnestly invoking the Holy Spirit, they made choice of the rule of St. Augustine, under which the holy patriarch had himself lived ever since he had assumed the habit of a canon regular at Osma, and which they had all hitherto observed. The simplicity of this rule, which merely enjoins the essential virtues of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and fraternal charity, rendered it a suitable basis for the constitutions by which St. Dominic was to mold the religious life of his sons and daughters. August 30th, St. Rose of Lima, Virgin, 1586-1617. This first flower of sanctity in the New World was born at Lima, the capital of Peru, in South America on the 20th of April, 1586, and received in baptism the name of Isabel but was always called Rose in consequence of a beautiful rose having appeared in the air above her cradle, gently touching her face and then vanishing. Later on, our Blessed Lady was pleased to add her own name to that of the Rose, saying to her in vision, Henceforth thou shalt be called the Rose of St. Mary. Thy soul shall be a fragrant flower consecrated to Jesus of Nazareth. Even from infancy the greatest graces were showered down on this favorite of heaven, and at the age of five she consecrated her virginity to God by vow. She was granted even at this early age a wonderful gift of prayer, kept herself continually in the presence of God, and made use of anything she saw and heard as a means of to lift up her heart to him. She was divinely inspired from her childhood upwards to practice in a heroic degree those virtues of penance and mortifications which were to be among the most striking characteristics of her future sanctity. She knew that the beloved of her soul had endured torments and death for her, and her love for him found expression in inflicting the severest sufferings on herself. She offered all her austerities to him, in expiation for her own sins and those of others, for the needs of the church, the conversion of sinners, and the relief of the poor souls in purgatory. She was very fond of fruit. From the age of four she absolutely forbade herself the use of it, and deprived her body as far as possible of everything which is pleasing to the senses. As she grew older, her scanty food consisted of hard crusts, tepid and nauseous water, and a soup of bitter herbs mingled with gall and ashes. On Friday she took only bread and gall. 
She sometimes entirely deprived herself of food for a whole week, and in the heat of a tropical climate would, for weeks at a time, abstain altogether from drinking. Her bed was composed of rough logs, strewn with bits of broken glass and earthenware. She denied herself even the scanty and troubled sleep she might have obtained on this instrument of torture, devising all sorts of painful expedients for keeping herself awake that she might watch with her lord. In addition to these and many other austerities, she took a severe discipline several times in the day, and wore on her head, dexterously concealed beneath her veil, a triple silver crown armed with ninety-nine sharp points, in memory of the crown of thorns of her divine spouse. On one occasion, when her mother insisted on placing a wreath of flowers on her head, Rose fastened it with a needle, which she ran so deeply into the flesh that it could with difficulty be removed at night. In the midst of all these terrible, inflicted sufferings, the saint's face was always serene and cheerful, and she showed perfect readiness to obey her confessors in everything which related to her penitential exercises. St. Rose was the most loving and dutiful of daughters, and devoted ten hours every day to working with her needle for the support of her family. For, though the de Flores were of noble descent, they were in very straitened circumstances. She had to undergo a painful persecution from her friends on account of her refusal to marry. Soon after this, she built herself a little wooden cell in a remote part of the garden, and there she spent the entire day of sol in solitude, only returning to the house late at night. This little cell became to her a paradise of delights. As she sat at her work, her divine spouse would often appear to her in the form of an infant of surpassing beauty, lying on her book or on her cushion, stretching out his little arms to her, and telling her that, as she wished to belong entirely to him, so he wished to be all hers, to take her heart and give her his in exchange. Like all faithful servants of God, St. Rose had to suffer continual assaults from the devil, and for the last sixteen years of her life, she was required to bear for an hour or more every day the most terrible spiritual desolation, in which her memory was completely obscured and she seemed to herself to be enduring the torments of purgatory or hell. But she manfully combated the attacks of the evil one with the arms of profound humility and boundless confidence in God, and in her dereliction abandoned herself wholly to the divine will. From childhood she had earnestly desired to wear the Dominican habit, with which her beloved patroness and model, St. Catherine of Siena, had been cl clothed. And in the twenty-first year of her age she was admitted to the Third Order, continuing to reside, as before, in her parents' house. Our Lord was pleased mystically to espouse her to himself with the words, Rose of my heart, be thou my spouse. From that time he took upon himself to provide for the wants of her family, leaving the saint free to devote her time to the service of the poor, the sick, and the afflicted. In her zeal for souls she was a true daughter of St. Dominic, and was spiritually envious of missionaries whose sex and vocation enabled them to carry the light of faith to the Indians and die a martyr's death. The last three years of her life were spent under the roof of Don Gonzalo de Massa, who held an important post under the viceroy, and whose wife was tenderly attached to her. 
It was in the house of these kind friends that she was attacked by her last illness, and there she died, repeating the words, Jesus, Jesus be with me, on the 24th of August, 1617. Many miracles and heavenly favors have been granted through her intercession. She was beatified by Clement the Ninth in 1668, and was canonized by Clement X in 1671, and has been declared patroness of America and of the Philippine Islands. September 3rd Blessed Gowala, Bishop and Confessor, 1244. Blessed Gowala was born of noble parents at Bergamo in Italy, towards the close of the 12th century, when our Holy Father, St. Dominic, came to preach and to found a convent of the order in that city, Gowala was the first to receive the habit from his hands. He accompanied the Holy Patriarch to Bologna, and was employed by him in the foundation of the monastery of St. Agnes for the sisters in that city, and afterwards in founding the order in Brescia. It was whilst he was prior in this latter place that he was favored with a revelation of the glory of his holy patriarch. Having prayed for him on the 6th of August, 1221, believing him to be still lying sick at Bologna, he fell asleep, leaning against the belfry of the church, and he seemed to see two ladders let down from an opening in the sky above him. At the top of one stood our Divine Lord, and His Blessed Mother was at the summit of the other. The angels were going up and down the ladders, and at their foot was seated one clothed in the habit of the order, but his face was covered with his hood, in the manner which the friars were wont to cover the face of the dead when carried out for burial. The ladders were drawn up into heaven, and he saw the unknown friar received into the company of the angels, surrounded by dazzling glory and borne to the very feet of Jesus. Gowala awoke, not knowing what the vision might mean, and, hastening to Bologna, he found that his great patriarch had breathed his last at the very moment at which it had appeared to him. This vision is commemorated in the third antiphon of Louds of our Holy Father's office. Father Bartholomew of Trent, who was an intimate friend of Blessed Gowala's, relates that, when St. Dominic's office was celebrated for the first time at Bologna after his canonization, Blessed Gowala who by that time had been raised to the Episcopal dignity, came to keep the joyful festival with his brethren, and that they made him sing the antiphon commemorative of his own vision, which he did with the utmost devotion. Contemporary writers tell us that Blessed Gowala was a man of consummate prudence, acquainted with the world, of distinguished manners, a true religious and an eloquent preacher, and that these qualities gained for him unparalleled influence both at the papal and imperial courts. He also enjoyed great popularity in Lombardy, where he did much to restore peace and concord between the rival factions of Guelphs and Ghibellines. While still a f simple friar, he was invested with the dignity of apostolic legate, and succeeded in bringing about a reconciliation between the Pope and the Emperor, Frederick the Second. It was probably about 1230 that he was made Bishop of Brescia. He governed his diocese with so much zeal, charity, prudence, and holiness, that he earned for himself the title of Father of the Poor, an advocate of widows and orphans. 
After undergoing many trials in defense of the liberties of his church, he was driven into exile by hostile factions, and spent five years in retirement and study in a convent of the Order of Val Umbrosa, near Bergamo. Returning at length to his see, he was welcomed back with universal joy, and again sedulously devoted himself to all the duties of a good pastor. In the year 1244, he was invited to Bergamo to lay the foundation stone of the Church of St. Stephen. Scarcely was the solemn rite concluded when the holy bishop was struck down by mortal illness. He died in the convent of Astino on the 3rd of September. Blessed Gowala has always been honored as a saint, and many miracles have been worked at his tomb. He was beatified by Pius the Ninth.